Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Age, Tech, and Arthritis, How Technology Can Help People Living with Arthritis. My name is Trish Barbado. I am so delighted to be here. I am the president and CEO of Arthritis Society Canada, and we are on a mission to fight the fire of arthritis in order to give those 6 million Canadians a voice about this disease. As many of you know, September is Arthritis Awareness Month, and I am so delighted to be moderating the H12 webinar that is exploring new innovations in age tech that hold great promise for people who are living with arthritis. And before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that although we are meeting virtually, we operate on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations, which have cared for the land for thousands of years, including the Anishin Abek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Windhoek, and the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This land remains home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, is subject to dish with one spoon, Wamhong Treaty, which is an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to work on this land today. You may live and work in different territories, so we encourage you to reflect on the land on which you are located and to consider your relationship to that land and to the people who are the traditional keepers of that land. All right, I'd also like to share with you a little bit of information about H12. H12 is Canada's technology and aging network, whose vision is that Canada's leadership in technology and aging, sometimes called age tech, can go and benefit the entire world. h mission is to develop a community of researchers, older adults, caregivers, partners, future leaders that accelerate the development of technology-based solutions that can make a meaningful difference in the lives of Canadians. And this translates into support for 250 researchers at 47 universities and research centers in Canada, 1,200 plus trainees, over 170 technologies, services, policies, practices, either in development or on the market, four national innovation hubs, over 5,000 engaged older adults and caregivers, many of whom are joining us today. Thank you very much for coming. So now it's time to welcome our three speakers. Dr. Shandran, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you are planning to share with us today? Hello, um, thank you for inviting me, uh, Trish. And uh, what I do, I'm a rheumatologist, which means I'm a specialist who looks after patients with arthritis. And I'm particularly focused on a kind of arthritis called psoriatic arthritis. It's a form of arthritis that happens in people with psoriasis, it's a, which is an autoimmune skin condition. And uh, I've been working in this area for almost um, 20 years now and looking at better means of assessing the disease as well as managing it. And what we'll be talking about today is trying to understand psoriatic arthritis when you're not in a doctor's office. And that can extend to all other forms of arthritis too. So um, monitoring of inflammatory arthritis. Thanks. Wonderful, and thank you very much. Uh, we also are very pleased to welcome Leanna Genovese at Imaginable Solutions. Leanna, it's so nice to see you, and what will you be sharing with us today? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much again for having me. Um, so I will be sharing with you my innovation called Guided Hands. It's an assistive device that helps people living with arthritis to write, paint, draw, and access technology. Um, so I'll be taking you a little bit behind our design process and um, just showing you how easy it can be. And maybe some people on the call can be innovators and create more solutions uh, to help people with arthritis. That sounds wonderful. And finally, we're very happy to have Bern Evans with us. Bern, tell us a little bit about your connection to H12. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. I'm a native Albertan, went to university in Edmonton, never left. Uh, recently, like six or seven years ago, I was appointed to the Older Adult and Caregiver Advisory Committee, we shorten it to OACAC, of H12. And so we have those bi-monthly board meetings and spin off into other forms of research. In terms of this seminar, I'm one of those that's living with, I would call it a relatively mild case of arthritis, but nonetheless a hindrance to my everyday living. Okay, there, I'll leave it there. 
that's great, Vern. Thank you so much. Well, we'll get going in a second and hear what our speakers have to share with us. And there will be a question period at the end. Uh, you can also use the chat function on Zoom to enter your question. If you aren't familiar with the chat function, it's the icon shaped like a speech bubble. If you click on that icon, you will open up a box where you can enter your question or your comment. We'll also be recording today's session and it will be available on YouTube channel if you wanna watch it again or share it with someone else. So let's start with Dr. Vinod. I'd like to begin with you. What have you been working on to help people with arthritis? Again, uh, I have a few slides. Should I share the slides, Trish? Yeah. Please, yeah, that would be great. Uh, here you go. I put on slides. Is that okay? So um, some disclosures here, nothing of uh, uh, particularly relevant to the current talk, but of course, some of the work that I'm doing is uh, funded by the Arthritis Society and that's right there. So um, I'm trying to understand inflammatory arthritis better. Uh, and I'm starting with psoriatic arthritis, the area the arthritis that I'm particularly interested in, but that could expand to other forms of arthritis and also um, osteoarthritis, uh, typically considered non-inflammatory, but if you actually look carefully, there is significant inflammation in osteoarthritis too. So, uh, so what happens when we monitor inflammatory arthritis or when you manage inflammatory arthritis is we need to um, carefully monitor the state of disease activity. Now, disease activity is a concept where, you know, there is what we believe a reversible component to it, which appropriately managed leads to better long-term outcomes. And that is a dynamic status where you have periods where things can go bad and, and periods when things improve uh, by maybe due to medications or other non-pharmacological means. And so monitoring that uh, would be important because in the long term, it, the longer the disease is active, it's more likely to cause more joint damage and other comorbidities, including cardiovascular disease. So when you treat inflammatory arthritis in particular, what we train to do, we try to reach a state of low disease activity or uh, ideally remission, which may not be always possible, but at least a low disease activity state. So that's the goal. And what happens currently is that patients come to clinic and a physician evaluates him or her or they. And uh, the, the ultimately what we do is we, the physician evaluates the patient has a, uh, their own um, uh, concept of how active the disease is and the blood work is also done. And all of this gives us different inputs. And ultimately we come to a shared decision whether the disease is active or not and what we can do about it. But all this happens in the clinic which is a problem as you know, because in a year you might see your physician maybe three times, four times uh, and uh, not that often, but you're living your life with the arthritis every day. So that's a bit, bit disconnect between what's happening in the clinic and what's actually happening. And the physicians are who are recommending treatment is biased by what they're seeing in the clinic. And so what we'd like to do is to have a better uh, assessment of the arthritis on a daily basis. And um, uh, this also uh, reflects on to the what's happening with virtual care when you're actually seeing a physician more often probably, but it's on a camera and you're not actually being assessed. Um, and so there is a disconnect there too. So we like to make these things better. And um, uh, currently what happens uh, in inflammatory arthritis is we have this periods of flare, which we don't understand when, it, when we don't see uh, the active joint in the clinic, you know, you, in your own practice and in your, in your interactions with your own physicians, you'll know, a lot of my patients tell me, oh, I was active last week, but when I come to see you, things are better. So I don't know what to say, but it was bad last week. And when I don't see anything uh, or, or last month for that matter, I I'm not unsure what to do with that information. So I'd like to get a more, um, a more handle on what's actually going on. And also for the patient, uh, monitoring this carefully 
would also empower them, right? So it empowers a physician and empowers the person with the arthritis. And so, uh, so that's one aspect about the disease in general. The other thing is about treatment. So when you start a treatment, nowadays we wait for a period of time, which is usually three months, maybe sometimes six months to see if the drug is working or not. Uh, probably we don't need to wait that long if we can actually monitor the status more frequently. So that's what we're trying to solve with this problem or for this with this solution. So uh, we're trying to monitor the arthritis remotely. So in my mind, when, a, when there is inflammatory arthritis, three things could be monitored. One, of course, most important is the patient's symptoms. How much pain, how much fatigue, which are the most uh, common symptoms patients with inflammatory arthritis have. The other thing is physical activity. When, you're, when a disease is active, you expect that you're less active uh, because of more pain and, and stiffness and inflammation. Um, so that could be tra tracked um, um, carefully with current technology. And then we could also monitor the inflammatory proteins in your blood, which may be going up and down uh, when these things are happening. So what we're trying to do is uh, first, you know, these are all um, uh, hypotheses. We'd like to actually see that what we think is happening is actually happening. So uh, we'd like to collect this information more frequently. And of course, when you get all this data, we'd like to integrate it and then actually make sense of it, interpret it. And that's what we're trying to do. So we don't have a product as yet, but what we're hoping to do with these a couple of studies that I'm mentioning over here, one is to look at these so-called flares. So uh, patients in my clinic, I explained to them what we, uh, the, the concept that I just mentioned, ask them to, um, and I, I evaluate them. Then when they're at home, every week, they uh, you know use the dry blood spot. There's a small spot of blood that you can put on a, a blotting paper and store it at your home and then send it to me once you have collected for a month, uh, you know, for, or uh, these samples can be kept at home in your fridge without a problem. And you can send it to me where I can test that in my lab. Uh, ask uh, uh, patients to wear this um, an act actigraph actometer, which accelerometer, which tells you how active you are, and of course uh, an app on the phone where you could record your uh, symptoms. And um, when you come back to my clinic in three or six months' time, I get all this information. I evaluate you again, and then see how things have changed we every week at home. Now this technology can do it every day, but I think that'll be too much every month, but that may be too little. So we thought it's good to try at a weekly assessment. So this is one project that we are aiming to do. And the other similar concept, when you start a new treatment, I mentioned we wait for three to six months. Maybe we can get to know whether the drug is going to work or not within the first few weeks. So why wait for three to six months? And when you wait, you know, there is, if the drug is not going to work, there's going to be more damage. Uh, more risk of side effects because you're taking a drug um, which uh, is not helping you, right? So we can, uh, with collecting the same kind of information on physical activities, symptoms, and your blood markers, uh, we can hope we hope to predict whether the early changes tell us in three to six months whether you're going to work or not, and the, the drug is going to work or not, and so that in the future we could um, not wait that long and monitor you more closely. Uh, and make the decision way before and switch drug if required way before. So these are the two proof of concepts that we're working on. If that works, we have enough, we'll have enough data to go forward in a, in a larger study and prove that it is actually going to help patients. I, I, I think it would, but of course in science, you've got to prove that. So what I'm going to do, we're going to shed light on what patients with arthritis experience when not in the clinic, so when at home. We get a better understand of the, understanding of the method, uh, the mechanisms, these blood markers. We can look at all the pathways that are being driven. We can help improve management of these symptoms. For example, if we can say, well, the blood changes are happening now, and this will predict a flare in a few weeks, then we can do something now to prevent that flare. And so overall quality of life improves and we prevent damage. Uh, and there's better communication, more empowerment of both the physician and the patient, because you're seeing this data that tells you what's going on. And, and of course, with the remote monitoring, we're really hoping to reach populations that live far away that I can only see once a year. Maybe I can uh, have a better understanding of what's going on by doing this um, uh, more uh, precise assessment. With that, I'll stop. Thank you.
My goodness, that is very ambitious. I love it. <laughs> That's great. And I know that um, all of our patients with autoimmune diseases would be really happy to understand their flare-ups better and what can prevent them and how to manage them. Um, what works and that kind of thing. So I think that's terrific. And we're very proud to be a supporter of that. And uh, welcome to Leanna, who I have known for quite a while. And you have a wonderful device that promises to um, be really helpful to people living with arthritis. And I wonder if you could give us more intel on that. Absolutely. So I'll share my screen as well. Okay, awesome. So hi everyone again, my name is Liana. I'm the CEO and founder of Imagine Able Solutions. So we create assistive technology to improve the quality of life for people living with limited hand mobility. So I'd like to first introduce you to my nonna, Ina. So Ina lives with severe rheumatoid arthritis and she, for mostly her entire life, she always worked with her hands. She worked in the garden. She was a talented seamstress. And now she, you know, those are a picture of her hands and she really does fight the fire of arthritis and it's very difficult for her to use her hands today. And, you know, she experiences limited control of her hand and arm or fingers. And this, lead, this also unfortunately leads to a loss of confidence, independence and self-expression as well for her. So I've created Guided Hands. It's an assistive device that enables people living with limited hand mobility to write, paint, draw, and access technology through using touchscreen devices and keyboards. So Guided Hands uses a unique sliding system that promotes controlled and guided hand movements as a user holds a handpiece tailored to their level of hand impairment. So here's a photo of Ina using Guided Hands to write a graduation card for her granddaughter. She also does crossword puzzles, paints, and uses technology to stay connected with her grandchildren, but gets carried away with the emojis. Um, so Guided Hands stimulates Ina's brain and allows her to express herself, which has reignited her confidence, creativity, and independence. As well, using Guided Hands also helps her maintain her sensory and cognitive skills. So limited hand mobility is a global problem. Now arthritis is, is just one of these conditions. It's the biggest, um, but there's so many other people in Canada and the US who live with a medical condition or injury that affects their hand mobility, such as cerebral palsy, ALS. And Guided Hands was actually, I was actually inspired to create Guided Hands for a woman living with cerebral palsy. So my background is in biomedical and mechanical engineering, and I actually created Guided Hands as a school project. Um, so Alyssa is the woman who lives with cerebral palsy, and she mentioned to me that uh, she experienced spasticity in her hand, hand and arm weakness, and very, a lot of um, pain using her fingers and grasping onto objects. So she mentioned that she had difficulties with holding onto writing utensils, cooking utensils, doing the buttons on her shirt. But the one thing that really stood out to me was that she was a talented painter. But as her condition progressed, she wasn't able to hold onto a paintbrush correctly. And there are many, many artists as well out there, like Maude Lewis, who's lived with arthritis, who was a painter as well. Um, but I wanted to create Alyssa something that gave her back her passion for painting. So now this is where I head into a little bit more of the design process. Uh, first prototype of Guided Hands was actually made out of pipe cleaner straws and a sponge. Um, this prototype just was more conceptual just to get what was in my head into real life. Uh, by the second prototype, I created Guided Hands using a styrofoam ball as the handpiece, a paint roller as the wrist rest. Um, and a lot of this is human-centered design. So having Alyssa try out all of these silly prototypes was very, very important to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our customer or patient. By the third prototype, we started to use 3D printing, which allowed us to have more customization with the parts that we were making. And this is just the current version of Got It Hands. So through each prototype, we've definitely learned um, from our patients through testing people with arthritis and Alyssa, all the different needs and how can we create towards fulfilling those needs. So the reason why I started my company was because of a little girl also living with limited hand mobility. And uh, since she was a little girl, I brought painting supplies with me and she had the widest smile spread across her face. She turned to her mom and said, mom, I want one. And then the mom turned to me and asked, how much is it? And at that point, the thought of selling this had never crossed my mind. But 
I knew that I created something that could really impact someone's life. So I created Imaginable Solutions. Now we do sell guided hands for $525 Canadian and we reach out to medical associations like UCP or Arthritis Society to create awareness. We sell to healthcare facilities, assistive technology centers and schools for children living with limited hand mobility. Now we've impacted or people have used Scotted Hands across North America and Singapore and we've made a great impact. Um, we've also, again, human-centered design. So we've been testing with tons of professionals, neurologists, occupational therapists and patients to make sure that our design meets the needs of our users. So we do a lot of co-creating with occupational therapists. Um, so this is just two examples. On the left is, um, and a pic photo that received from On With Life, Iowa's Assistive Technology Center in the US. So they actually created stands uh, to incline guided hands. Uh, they say that it feels more comfortable when it's on an incline. And on the right, someone who has more hand uh, and forearm or shoulder weakness, they've actually put a splint on the device so that they can further support along the length of their arm. And this is really helpful for people um, who don't have a lot of muscle strength for older adults as well. Um, so we definitely learn with our occupational therapists and we've actually co-created uh, a worksheet package to help people become familiar with using guided hands. So um, just really having people keep up their sensory and cognitive skills through uh, fun and engaging worksheets as well. This is just our team of engineers and advisors and one of our key advisors on the bottom right is Ron Bellino. He's actually from the age well community and he gives us awesome insight into aging and caregivers and and how we can again just really make sure that our product is meeting the needs of older adults who live with arthritis, other medical conditions, and even children who live with juvenile arthritis too. And together we've transformed Guided Hands into an international award-winning product. Uh, we did win the Arthritis Society uh, Canada's People's Choice Award. Uh, Trish actually gave me the award on stage, which was awesome. Uh, we won the James Dyson Engineering Award, the guy who vented the vacuum cleaner. And we are proud to say that we came second place at the Age Well National Impact Challenge. So. Uh, actually, we are also an AgeWell startup affiliate, so we work with AgeWell all the time, and they're just so, so helpful. Um, and again, it is Arthritis Awareness Month, just like what Trish had mentioned. Um, so we are offering 10% off Guided Hands, um, just the discount codes there, and you don't have to take a picture of this or anything because it's also on our website um, so that everyone knows. And again, we are a proud recipient of the Arthritis Society Canada's People's Choice Award. And together, we're just working towards helping improve the quality of life for people of all ages who live with limited hand mobility and want to just get back out into expressing themselves and have more confidence as well. Thank you. That's great, Liana. It's uh, definitely been really wonderful for me to watch you and uh, kind of see the progression over the years of this idea that you had and then turning it into a product and now turning it into a company. So it's really fantastic and I really um, applaud you. So Vern, what are your thoughts as someone who is a patient advocate and consumer? What are your thoughts on what you've heard so far? kind of a wow. I, I don't know if you can see them, but you can see some pretty gnarly hands there. That's a relatively recent thing. So let me back up a little. <clears throat> my first notice of some arthritis in my body was quite a while ago. And it was in what I call my lower right love handle. <laughs> and I hadn't paid attention, but my wife started to point out that she looked like she thought that I was walking dog trotting slightly sideways. So I went to my physician. He suggested that I go to see a physiotherapist who is an expert in IMS, which is some kind of, it's a deep needle intramuscular stimulation, they called it. And I'll never forget standing there in just my shorts with the physiotherapist behind me and saying, well, I can see that you have damage in X, Y, Z, you know, without giving you the technical stuff that I don't remember. And I said, how do you know that? And he said, well, you've got some symptoms I can tell without even touching you. He did IMS on the back and it helped for quite a while. But in the meantime, I also developed, and I don't know, it is related to squeezing of the pads between the vertebrae affecting nerves. I have quite a problem with what's called the iliotibial bands or for short English, the IT band, and it's the muscle that connects the hip 
to the knee on the outside. Some days they're fine. I had started a walking program with my exercise club, but there are other days and I, you know, I'd go on five to seven K walks, but I discovered other days I went to five to 10 meter walks because of these doggone pains in the legs. And there was enough there that my doctor thought perhaps I was showing arthritis in my hips and or knees. And so he sent me for x-rays and fortunately for me, it showed very little of those joint damages. So the problem is not arthritis in my knees, but the arthritis certainly shows up in my back. Um, part of it, I guess, is the way I sleep. I'm immobile when I sleep. So when I wake up, I'm stiff. And I find bending over kind of a laborious process. I bend over very slowly, pick something up and then straighten back up slowly. And otherwise I trigger a vertigo and probably the vertigo is an aftermath. I had a very mild stroke six years ago, but it did affect my balance. It hit the bottom of my brain out here where the balance center is. So when I combine that with the ongoing arthritis, I have some real limitations in what I can do. I can't play volleyball or baseball anymore because I'm slow. I can play golf, you know, the ball's stationary and I can swing at it. But again, the hands are not very good at holding onto a golf club. I've had to oversize my grips in a couple of cases, but at least I can get outdoors and do that. When I was a young man, I was very involved in sports and athletics and outdoors and hiking and camping and fishing. And I was coaching athletic teams by the time I was 14. I've just been involved out there and this has really slowed me down. Um, and what do you think is important as we have uh, entrepreneurs and innovators thinking about that people centricity and making sure that they have human centered design and include um, that aspect of it. Like, what are your thoughts about the design well, thinking component of innovation? When Leanna, when Leanna mentioned human centered design, I kind of went, wow, you know, good for you. Back when I was in graduate school, it was one of the things we were studying in human engineering was, you know, trying to get the human component into the design of manufactured processes rather than just some guy deciding that this widget should be built this way. So I think she's done a marvelous job in sort of starting with a primitive version and getting to a much more sophisticated version. And I suspect, Leanna, I, I may need such a beast down the road because of what's happening with my hands. I also notice for Dr. Vinod's information, I get these flares occasionally in my knuckles. All of a sudden, this knuckle on my fourth hand is, is hurting. I can't quite tell why, but it's hurting. Then it goes away after a day or two. I sometimes rub it with a, an, an ointment. And I just discovered in the last week or so that I get some kind of a pain in my foot, which is probably also arthritic. And you know that may get worse as it goes on. I can't walk a golf course anymore. I have to ride a cart. I can get up and you know, go over to my ball but it certainly has limited the things that I can do. I'm a gardener. Mm -hmm. I've spent six or eight hours in the garden. Now, if I'm out there for two hours on my hands and knees, I'm done. I'm pooped. I have to go inside and have a cup of tea and sort of that's it for the day. So it has really limited both my time doing things and the speed at which I can do them. And yet I'm one of the lucky ones. I can stand up straight and I can talk to you and I'm not debilitated. I do occasionally walk with a pair of walking sticks, which help keep me more upright and balanced a little better. But uh, so how do I sort of react to what you had posed to me? Yes, I'm living with arthritis and it certainly influences my day to day. But as I said, I'm lucky it hasn't completely knocked me off my feet. Mm -hmm. I don't know, does that sort of tell you where yeah, I'm Yeah, no, that's from? great. That's great. And, and sort of picking up on that, Dr. Chandra, and I'll just turn this to you. What are some of the practical things that you tell your patients in terms of, you know, managing a chronic disease? Are there some tips and things that you repeat to almost every patient that our audience might find beneficial? And you're just muted. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, the um, one thing is understanding a disease, right? So what are the triggers that, that uh, uh, cause things to get a little off balance. Um, and so recording your, having a diary, is, it's easier now with technology, noting on when some things are going wrong and then trying to track back and see when did the last thing happen and then go back to your diary to see uh, what, what you did and maybe not do the next time. And you can always um, reach out to one of us to kind of discuss if that's important or not. And 
uh, just I spent quite some time on that, and as well as um, this, uh, especially I, I see most most patients with um, inflammatory arthritis, or uh, as opposed to more of uh, diseases uh, which are more uh, systemic in nature, for example, lupus and stuff like that. So I have patients mostly with having significant joint pain, and so uh, in all these diseases, it's important to. Uh, be mobile and active as much as possible. It's difficult, but and sometimes your symptoms seem to take a back, get worse when you actually start doing it. But eventually, with a perseverance and support of your friends and family and as professionals, you can get there. So understanding your symptoms and then working with it and um, uh, with your physicians and partners to be active makes a big difference in most conditions, be it osteoarthritis or psoriatic or rheumatoid. So uh, we always spend a lot of time on, on what are you doing and what you could do better and how can we get you get you get there. The medications are important, you know, monitoring the blood work, that's all important, but at the end of the day, you really want to be as um, you know, useful, feel happy about what you're doing. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, certainly our therapists in our arthritis rehab and education program always talk about motion is lotion. Yeah. And that movement is just so important, even though sometimes you may not feel with arthritis like you want to move. But yes, it's really important. And I just wanted to remind our audience that we would love to see your questions. They can just go in your chat button, which is just on the bottom of your Zoom. So feel free to throw some questions out there and I will uh, be monitoring that and be asking. But um, in the meantime, maybe I'll turn, uh, Burn. yes, you would like to add something, please. Okay. Well, I also wanted to point out, again, probably for both of your other panelists, I've, I've noticed a tremendous loss of strength, especially in my hands. I mean, I was very strong in the hands. I grew up on a ranch, you know, pitching bales. I was milking cows. I was very, very strong in the hands. I now find it sometimes, you know, hard to open a pickle jar. I just, I don't have enough strength in there to do those things. And I find the same thing in my legs. I mentioned this IT band kind of related, I think, to a, a nerve in the uh, sacral part of my back. Again, we don't would know better than me. But uh, when they're hurting, I'm really limited in terms of how far I can walk. But I also find that going upstairs, I'm very careful. And I hold on to the wall or the railing to keep my balance. And I go very slowly, but I have certainly lost a lot of strength in the uh, upper muscles of my legs. Uh, I guess you call them the, the quads. That I think is related again to this arthritis involvement. It, it may not be, but I'm sort of throwing that out. So that's a real limitation for me in terms of what exercise I can do. I, you know, the motion is lotion idea. I, I can only do less in a given amount of time and I can't do it for as long as I used to. I, I try, as I mentioned, I do my exercise class at least twice a week, at golf and garden and stuff, but uh, it's certainly not what it used to be five years ago. That's mm -hmm. all. Well, it's great you're still moving. That's uh, really so important and keeping your body as strong as possible. Um, that's great. So Leanna, I wondered in your device, what do you find um, in terms of people learning how to use it and feeling comfortable? using it, does it take a while for people to get used to it? How, how does, yeah, tell us a little bit more about the journey of someone buying it and then using it. Yeah, for sure. So learning how to write is a skill that we all learned growing up. I'm sure everyone can remember, you know, doing their A's and B's and C's on a line piece of paper when you're just starting out. And that's kind of similar to Guided Hands. And that's why we created that worksheet package to help people become familiar with the different ranges of motions and movements that they can use with Guided Hands. So taking people through different activities and, you know, connecting the dotted lines and practicing writing out your sentences on paper is, is really great to familiarize themselves. And then also we learn from occupational therapists that they're using those activities for people who've experienced injuries, spinal cord injury, stroke. So it's been great to help familiarize the person as well as, you know, making rehabilitation more fun. Um, but definitely to learn how got, learn how to use got at hands probably takes minutes. It's just you know, either having someone show you how to hold on to it correctly and move around, going through those worksheet packages or just seeing a video. Um, 
the the best part about our product is that it's very very simple um, it's all mechanical there's no electronics there's no calibration or batteries or wi-fi needed um, so you can really just put your hand on it and, and go but we do have those worksheet packages to help that um, that user experience mm -hmm. One of the things I'm always curious about, because I think that we do have a lot of things that might help people uh, with arthritis, but it's never easy to necessarily to find it. I'm sure people are, you you probably think everyone knows about your product, you know, Leanna, or should know about it, but you're always surprised that people have never seen it before and don't know anything about it. And I'm curious about sort of maybe how each of you either keep up to what is happening or learn about small or large innovations and technologies that can help you in, in um, you know, managing disease with people with arthritis, but for you, Burn, for you, like, do you have things that can help you open that pickle jar at home? These things are out there. Um, so maybe we could talk a little bit about that, which I think speaks to for technology and innovation, the distribution component, the kind of commercialization component. So perhaps, um, um, Dr. Chandra, why don't we talk, start with you in terms of supporting your your patients and how how do you how do you help them in that regard so um you know things are changing so quickly right so that's a problem and uh, i myself don't know what's out there uh, so uh on one hand we don't like to see all those emails coming into your inbox but then there's occasionally a really good uh video or email that comes and say hey do you know about this technology and and many of the time frankly it's the patients who come and say hey doc did you notice this i saw this and i think it's a great idea what do you think about it and uh, we uh, in our own group we have um, advisory group of patients who we meet every few months and uh, discuss projects ideas what new that they have seen what new is there from a the medical point of view and have a good uh, conversation um and then I also keep an eye out on, uh, you know, being part of other uh, research groups. Um, at here in the hospital, we have the Toronto Rehab Institute that does a lot of um, technology development, not specifically for arthritis, but for mobility and other things that mm -hmm. keep an eye on. Um, talk to engineers, um, uh, participate in stuff like the Creative Destructive Lab, where they uh, look at new entrepreneurs and try to develop their companies and uh, be involved with that. So multiple sources of information, uh, but I think most of the time I get ideas about new stuff right from the patients and having the time to discuss um, within the clinic, which is always a challenge, but outside when we have uh, discussions and uh, with them. And of course, um, uh, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and uh, other agencies, including the Arthritis Society that really uh, supports all this that's that's going on. So it's multiple sources, very hard to pinpoint, and things are changing so rapidly that uh, you really have to be on your toes to keep up with it. Uh, thank you so much. How about you, Leanna? I think AgeWell does an incredible job of highlighting innovation within the age tech space. Um, I always, you know, I'm, I connect with the entrepreneurs whenever I see a really cool innovation and I, you know, network with them. So I feel like they do an amazing job of, you know, posting the new innovation that's out there as well. I'm subscribed to the Arthritis Society Canada newsletter, and I feel like um, there's always such great, um, you know, different things available as well. That's, that's new and upcoming. And, uh, and I think for me, the, the ways that, um, you know, we always ask our customers, how, how are you learning about assistive technology or, you know, the newest medical innovations? Um, it's, it's a lot of Google searching. Um, Google has definitely been my best friend in entrepreneurship. Um, but I think just in terms of finding what's out there and just staying connected with the news is so important to see what current and new advancements are out there for arthritis and other conditions. Um, but yeah, that's great. And how about you, Bern? I know you wanted to jump in. And you're just muted. As an example, this is the first that I knew of Leanna's product, mm -hmm. which I think is a wonderful thing in terms of those of us that have these kinds of problems. I have talked to several physicians trying to ask them what they know about the age tech that age well has evolved. And to this date, 
none of them are aware of any of it. So we're missing somewhere in the communication process about the effectiveness of the majority of the age tech things that are being developed. I mean, I, I know some others as well as, as the uh, arthritis things. And maybe I'm not very good at actively seeking out what's out there. Ron Bellano is our, or Bellino, however you say it, is our chairperson. And I get a fair bit of feedback from Ron, but it's not daily or weekly. And we have our bi-monthly meetings and occasionally in between we communicate. Um, and here I am, you know, out in the middle of the prairies, long ways away from what sometimes is a center of actions in lower on, uh, Ontario, where you have more things in a smaller space and maybe an easier way to keep track. <clears throat> out here, I have some friends at the U of A and it's how I got involved with OAC, AC and some other things, but I'm sure there's lots more that I should know about age tech that I don't know. I'm going to have to be a little more personally active, I guess, in going out there. And you just saw in the, in the chat down there that a connection to the Arthritis Society of Canada. I haven't got that. I'll pick that up shortly. Thank you. So yeah, that's I'll, great. I'll there. But I think it is, it is um, uh, you know, there's a lot happening and things are yeah. happening rapidly and trying to keep up with all that can be challenging. I know we have a couple of questions from folks who've raised their hands. So perhaps we'll go to that next. And I think uh, Allison is moderating that. Yeah, Deirdre, um, if you want to unmute, you okay. can ask your question. Thanks, Deirdre. Um, I think my chat is turned off. I don't know if that's on your end or my end. I think it must be your end. Oh, you can't post? No. Okay. Well, did you have a question that you'd like to ask verbally? Yes, I wanted to ask Dr. Shandron about uh, his system and whether it is... Um, if people who have osteoarthritis can use that system as well, if they needed to. I mean, I have some arthritis, but I'm managing reasonably well, so I'm not worrying about it too much. Right, uh, I must remind you that's still a work in progress. I don't have a product that I can say, yes, use my system. I hope to get there. Uh, and so what, at the moment we are working, you're testing it on uh, psoriatic arthritis patients uh, because we like to get um, you know a good signal uh, from the blood markers also, but I don't see a reason why we cannot use that. Uh, for different diseases, the, the model for looking at the data might be different. Uh, uh, the, in osteoarthritis, maybe the, the inf information that we get from the blood may not be that uh, that key uh, it'd be more about function and and the symptoms that the, that you're recording. So uh, we eventually hope to, you know, we are doing this as a proof of concept, and then get it out there to to osteoarthritis, which is um, quite uh, you know the, the largest, the most common form of arthritis out there, right? With the biggest impact. So yes, that's the goal, but we are not there yet. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Allison, do we have another person live that wanted to speak? She's posted in the chat now. Okay, great. Uh, Deborah. I think this is for Dr. Chandran as well. For osteoarthritis, what is the best kind of test? An x-ray, ultrasound, what is the best way to diagnose? Right, there, there, there's no single test for osteoarthritis. It's, um, yeah, you know, it's, uh, your um, evaluation by a clinician, uh, it need not be a rheumatologist, uh, and the kind of symptoms that you have and what uh, the clinician is seeing uh, in your joints. Um, there's no blood test for it. It's, uh, and x-rays do show changes, but that's usually uh, when it's quite advanced. And we generally don't do x-rays if uh, um, routinely it's done if you're thinking of surgery, for example. So uh, there's not, you know, a test you, it's a, the, the diagnosis is made by looking at your symptoms, uh, which joints are affected, how it is affected, and the, the impact that, has ha that, that it has on you. So um, I guess not a straightforward answer, but it's a physician-patient 
thing, the clinician patient uh, interaction that gives you the diagnosed osteoarthritis. Yeah, and I'll just mention as well that in Ontario, we do have a free program with highly trained physiotherapists and occupational therapists and social workers who can do free um, assessments and, and take a look at your situation around arthritis. So I'll just uh, mention that that is an available resource. Deborah, um, the other question we have for Mike is about an objective measure of mobility or a research supported standard measurement for mobility in relation to arthritis. So more structured than anecdotal or journaling. Um, I'm not an expert on mobility. I don't know if we can um, really um, compare between folks. My uh, focus is on looking at uh, you know, looking at your own data over time to see where you are uh, and uh, trying to, um, with the data that we collect, try to figure out what the, the best it is. And especially with treatment, you're trying to bring uh, improved mobility and function, uh, but not to a normal, or what should I say, uh, an average of a group of people, but to where you would like to come to, because we're collecting data in a longitudinal fashion, um, both when things are good and when both when things are not good, right? So um, that that measurement of, um, I think it's a work in progress. I think with the newer technologies where you can actually uh, measure what exactly what what's happening uh, on a you know from a minute to minute it would change things uh, from what was in the past where we are you know filling up questionnaires and um, mentioning about what you can do. Um, uh, so I think it's a work in progress and we would have a better idea in, in a few years from now. Yeah, I'll just mention that uh, one of the other winners from the Arthritis Ideator Awards was a company called MeKG. So you can think about it as a live diagnostic, like a heart EKG, it's for your knees. And so the device is strapped on, the person is walking on a treadmill, and it provides very deep real-time data about what is happening in the knee and around their mobility. And the objective would be that that could then be used to better determine whether the person is in fact a good candidate for a, a knee replacement or not, if they are a good candidate for some other um, treatment option, and again, would provide that I think what you're after, Mike, is a better understanding of the mobility level that's measured very objectively. So I, I think you're right. I think that these technologies are coming, but they're not perhaps as far as we would like them to be, but they're definitely coming. I think the same is true around gait. Uh, we've seen some technology as well with our IDATA awards around that um, kind of gait measurement and uh, as a proxy for mobility. So I think that this is all all in the works in many different ways. Burn, yes, please. Well, just also responding to Mike, <clears throat> I think there's a real need for before and after measures of mobility of knees, legs, et cetera, et cetera. I have a friend who had her knee operated on because of this whole arthritic problem. And they didn't do a before versus after. She had quite a hitch in her to get along before the surgery. She still has it. There seems to be some pain, but I don't know how you would compare that. So I'm just throwing out to Mike that if you're talking to physicians or exercise physiologists, there should be a before and after, especially if surgery is involved. That's all. Mm -hmm. That's great. Dr. Shandra, I think this one is for you. How active should a patient be, especially if they are aged? Well, my answer would be as active as possible, given the limitations. And the, the more you can, more active you are, you're more likely to, you know, not just the joints, your own cardiovascular, other health, um, all that's going to be important. And of course, the question is, is there a ceiling? There was a, there's a study uh, recently published, I think people who watch the CBC or listen to the CBC radio, it was in quotes and quotes the last week. It's about the 10,000 steps, right? So. Uh, where did the number come from and is it really a number? So that, you know, it, I guess I, it was news to me when the researcher who worked on it um, uh, uh, using the data from the um, UK Biobank where they had collected, I think it was 80,000 folks who had their um, 
you know, mobility device, the accelerometer, and they could count the steps. Uh, and the question was, was 10,000 steps a thing or not? So because the Japanese company that came up with this 10,000 steps was, it was a marketing thing. It was nothing, no signs. They just said 10,000 steps. It's a good number. Everybody can remember. Try to get 10,000 steps. So they looked at the, the um, this in this UK biobank, um, which, you know, that's the power of, uh, I'm digressing a little bit, the power of having this database with all the genomic other information and more additional information linked to hard clinical outcomes. And uh, and it's publicly available, publicly in the sense that a researcher could request a UK biobank, please give me that data, I would analyze it. And you got to pay some money to get that data, but then you can do this, such powerful studies on large number of patients. Anyway, so these guys use that data to look at 10,000 steps and guess what? Yes, 10,000 steps is a, uh, is a good target. And the question was, what about going more than that? We assume the more the better, but it seems that the additional benefit was not really there. So 10,000 was a good number. But importantly, it's also not just taking your own sweet time to reach the 10,000 step to be as fast as you can get, get to that, right? You have to be the, the pace as well as the 10,000 was important. So answering your question as much as you can uh, to, to your limit, uh, ability, but probably don't overdo it because there could be some, well, may not be, um, may not have a significant adverse effect, but there's no, um, there's no, big advantage of going more than that limit. So uh, there are guidelines out there on how active you should be and following that uh, and trying to do it as diligently and not when you have a problem, but as all people, you know, starting way, way young, letting everybody know, hey, by the way, everybody's gonna get old, but you can live a great life if you're, you know, do all these things way before you get into trouble. So it's interesting that we are able to do all these studies and get more interest, you know, more knowledge up here. Yeah, I agree. And we certainly also support that very much at Arthritis Society Canada and just finding what you can do. Can you swim? Can you move around in a pool? Can you do chair aerobics? Can you, you know, there's, there's just like, what can you do and uh, not let arthritis stop you from moving and from, from keeping active. It has so many benefits as well mentally, doesn't it? Not just uh, physically. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, one of the questions that I think we could also touch on is one in the questions around what are some of the problems that we need solutions for? So what are the, some of the problems that people with arthritis have that it would be wonderful to have a solution for? And in some ways, I think even in the questions, we saw something around that more consistent measurement of mobility or of progression that could be true for so many things, including pain and uh, you know, mobility, but are there any others that come to mind for any of our panelists around what would be great to solve? Bern, why don't you start? Probably futuristic on my, my hand, but when I see surgeries that have gone from, you know, opening up the stomach to do a appendectomy to laparoscopic surgeries for gallbladders and other things. And then I see pictures of people working on microsurgeries, you know, their hand thing here is working on a little tiny brain surgery thing over there. And I'm wondering surgically, and I'll throw this probably back to the, you know, but is it possible in the future that we would see reshaping the arthritic joints that are causing all the problems and or reinsertion of the, uh, I forget the term, but the pads in between, the, the tissue that sometimes tears when we're exercising. You know, it, is it possible to reshape those joints, to reshape a hip ball, to reshape a knee joint, or perhaps even my, and this is known as wonky knuckles. Did you see that as something possible down the road? And I know that's very futuristic. I take a couple of mild medications when I'm hurting and I thought maybe I would also throw to be not what kind of medications he's prescribing as a rheumatologist. That's me. Can I respond to it? Yeah, medications, uh, it's a work in progress. Now for the inflammatory arthritis, there's been huge progress in um, uh, because they are mostly immune mediated. So there are these immunosuppressives that prevent damage, especially if you're diagnosed early. 
Now, but that's a small percentage of the arthritic you know, world, right? The biggest problem is osteoarthritis where we have singularly lack uh, a so-called disease modifying drug Mm-hmm. And and it's been a big challenge. Um, and more recently, there have been trials trying to develop these uh, so-called disease-modifying drugs. But it's the uh, the it's the heterogeneity of the disease. So osteoarthritis is not just one disease. There's many reasons for it. And so, by understanding the disease better, uh, is it a cartilage problem? Is it a bone problem? Is it a synovium problem? And then targeting that. Um, um, mechanism early could prevent uh, the osteoarthritis from progressing. So uh, that's a work in progress. Um, we don't have any treatments as yet. The, uh, the other, you said mentioned, you know, growing back stuff. So regenerative medicine is again, um, uh, a lot of focus is being uh, put on that. Should we, you know, could we regrow the cartilage or modify the bone to to get it back to the original. Uh, again, a lot of uh, work is ongoing, but there's nothing ready yet to kind of say, yes, this is a treatment. Uh, more recently, um, there's also a lot of push for so-called biological therapy, meaning uh, you know, platelet-rich plasma and other uh, injections into the joints. Uh, I think jury is still out. My reading of the literature has not shown a clear benefit but when I talk to the surgeons, again, it depends on choosing the right patient, et cetera, right? So uh, we'll probably get more, um, uh, as better studies are done and more data is accumulated, we know who to give what and who requires a surgery right away and who we can, um, we don't have, you know, we can wait for longer and do some of the other methods to improve function and reduce pain. So uh, especially in osteoarthritis, uh, lots of unmet needs, um, getting the diagnosis right, getting the type of osteoarthritis, uh, treating depending on what type it is. And, and thankfully, there's a lot of interest in, and many researchers are working on it and hopefully we'll have solutions soon. That's great. And um, I think we're just at almost at time here. Really appreciate all of our panelists and thank you for everyone who submitted a chat or a question. And before we go, I don't want to forget to ask you all to mark your calendars for the AgeWell Annual Conference, which is coming up on October 18th to 20th, and that will be in Regina. This event is for anyone with an interest in technology and aging. It'll be showcasing research and innovation from across the country, connecting AgeWell partners, researchers, stakeholders, members of the public, so that will be great. And I am also very excited to announce our second annual Arthritis Ideator Awards, which will be launching next month in October. And we welcome entrepreneurs and innovators to apply. We will have four $50,000 awards. And congratulations again to Leanna, who was one of our winners at our inaugural Ideator Awards night last year, or this earlier this year. More details can be found on our website at arthritis.ca. So that is all for today. If you'd like to watch this or share with a friend, we do have a recording of the webinar and that will be posted on the YouTube channel in about a week. I just want to thank everyone so much for being here and really appreciate uh, your time and your energy. And we will say goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you.